and we'll do some quick introductions. So I'll start. And uh, again, I'm Sarah Marino. I'm based in southwestern Colorado in a little town at the base of the San Juan Mountains. And I live here part time and then I travel around in an Airstream across the American West with my husband, Ron, who's also a nature photographer. Uh, we bring along our kitty and we stay in places for an extended period of time. I'm a full-time nature photographer and I photograph everything in nature from grand landscapes to intimate landscapes, so scenes within a scene, um, abstract subjects in nature, and then portraits of plants, which we're obviously talking about today. And um, I use the word portrait really deliberately because I, I like to think of portraits of plants like a portrait of a person, where I'm trying to convey something unique about the personality and the intricacies and details, uh, what's special or expressive about the subjects that I choose to photograph. Uh, so in addition to photographing, I also teach workshops and write eBooks, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So how about you, Anne? Well, hello everyone. I'm just delighted to be here and thank you all for coming. Um, I am a nature photographer based in the Chicago area and I specialize in flower and botanical photography. My true passion is really seeing the world up close. I love macro photography and capturing those, those details in nature and then um, bringing those, those magical details to other people's eyes. Um, most of my work is photographed at the Chicago Botanic Garden, which is about 10 minutes from my home. Yeah, I know, I'm lucky. <laughs> and I, you know, I have to admit, I took it for granted until it was all pulled out from under me with the shutdown. And I realized, what am I going to do <laughs> without the garden? But I, I'm happy to say that, that you know, we have to embrace what we're given. And I was able to really throw myself into re-exploring my neighborhood, a neighborhood that I've lived in for 30 some odd years, but I found plentiful subjects and um, that really helped sustain me going out with my camera every day and exploring it, it helped me sustain sustain me and keep me centered during that difficult time. So an important thing to know about me is that um, I have a former career as an art therapist and it's really shaped the way that I approach my photography and my teaching. I believe deeply in the healing aspects of art and of being in nature. And my goal as an educator is to help reawaken um, the creative spirit, to really teach people to photograph from their heart, to put their inner light into their work and to see more deeply. Um, most of my work is photographed with lens baby lenses, probably about 90% of my work. And I'm really passionate about um, sharing that knowledge and, and my love for those lenses with other people. So I always encourage people to reach out to me if they have questions or want to know more about the lenses. The, the lenses really um, changed my photography and they, they helped me to photograph my subjects in the way that I feel them. So um, I'm excited to share some of that with you today. So that's me. Great. Thanks, Anne, for the introduction. So now I'm going to restart the PowerPoint so that you can all see our slides. Does that look right, Anne? Yes. Okay. Uh, so Anne and I are doing this presentation as a preview to our four hour session that we are going to pre be presenting on this same topic at Out of Chicago In Depth, which is an online photography workshop weekend. So there will be more than 30 live in depth sessions from more than 50 inspiring photographers. And again, all of these sessions are online so you can participate from the comfort of your home. Uh, we are going to specifically be talking about photographing plants and flowers in new and creative ways, uh, going really in depth about a wide variety of topics, including creativity, uh, personal expression, improving your observational skills, composition, working with light, technical essentials, and creative photo processing. And we're really going to try to give a lot of practical advice about how you can expand your ability to photograph plants and flowers in creative ways, giving dozens of examples from our own photo portfolios. So if you're interested in participating, you can register at outofchicago.com in-depth 
and you can save $50 off your registration with the code BOTANICAL. Uh, I will be sending out a follow-up email after this session that will include more information about the conference. So um, if you're interested, there will be a link and then you can learn more about our session and then the 30 other sessions that will be included in the conference. Um, Anne, do you have anything to add about that before we move on? Well, I think an important thing to know is that even though you'll only be able to watch a, probably a maximum of five um, of these in-depth workshops during the weekend, they will all be available via video. The videos will be posted, you know, within a day of, of the presentation, and you'll be able to watch them for a full year. And um, we, we know based on our April co online conference that it, it, was, it was phenomenal, and people really enjoyed not only being a part of the the, the real conference, but then being able to continue to watch all these presentations um, again and again if they wanted to. So um, it's, it's, it's really a wonderful experience. Of course, I'm on the team of Out of Chicago, so I'm a little biased, but uh, everybody loved it. We just got amazing feedback about it. So I hope you'll join us. One thing I forgot was to mention the date. So it's August yes. 21st to 23rd for the main set of sessions. And then we'll have image reviews on September 2nd and 3rd. And again, you can participate from the comfort of your house. Right. And we're going to give, we're going to give some assignments for you to work on between the, the actual conference and the image reviews. And um, Sarah and I have been working on them and we have some really fun assignments to give for ours. So um, it really gets people, we want to get people out to shoot. It's not just about listening to, to, you know, the presentations. It's about getting out and creating your own work and then being able to show it. So hopefully some of you will join us for that deep dive session. Uh, we also have a big bonus today. Since Anne is a Lens Baby ambassador, we have a couple of prizes to give away to participants. So Anne will give a quick review of that too. Yes. Well, so after the after the um, the webinar today, Sarah will generate a list of everybody that participated today, and we will randomly um, pick one winner for a Soul Forty Five or Twenty Two. This is one of my absolute favorite lenses. It's really fun, really creative, and very easy to use. I think it's the easiest of the lens baby lenses to use. And whether you choose the Soul 45, which is for DSLRs or mirrorless, or the 22, which is um, for micro four thirds, I can help guide you with that. Um, we'll have a winner of that lens and then two $50 lens baby gift cards that can be used for, um, for any equipment purchase. So thank you to Lens Baby for providing these. Yeah, very generous. Thanks for giving an overview of that, Anne. And then Anne, we'll talk a little bit more about Lens Baby um, as part of, I think, one of her case studies, right? Yes. I actually, one of the images I'm talking about is shot with a soul. So awesome. Great. Well, with that, we will move into my case studies. So as I mentioned before, I am mostly a nature photographer and plants and flowers play a major role in how I photograph. So I'm going to be talking today about a lot of different types of plants and flower photography, not just in gardens or in my yard. And I'll, tell, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but I do feel like that's an important premise just to know that this fits in with a much larger body of work that I have through my photography. Um, I've written two eBooks on this topic. So if you happen to be interested in learning more just how I generally approach photographing nature's small scenes, including plants and flowers, I have two eBooks. So Beyond the Grand Landscape and then 11 Composition Lessons for Photographing Nature's Small Scenes. And all of the ideas that I'm going to be talking about today are covered in both of these resources. Uh, so I'm going to start really big picture. And for me, photography is about seeing all sorts of opportunities in nature. And as I mentioned, I came to photography through nature photography. And uh, coming up in the field of nature photography, I think just generally helped shape my approach of how I see the world. But as I started to find a more personal path, I realized that I had to unlearn a lot of conventional wisdom and rules uh, that you learn when you start out in nature photography. Uh, so to be able to express my view of the natural world, I had to stop thinking about things like you should only photograph during the, during the golden hour and you should never center your composition. 
and those kinds of arbitrary rules that are really limiting. So I've come to think of my approach to nature photography as being um, encapsulated in what I call an expansive approach. So I seek to see opportunities instead of accepting limitations. So I photograph at all times of the day in all different types of, types of lighting conditions, just as one example. Um, I also try to make connections with nature in the moment. So I'll go out into nature not exactly knowing what to expect. So yesterday, my husband and I, uh, we went out on a local hike and we were surrounded by some of the most beautiful mountains in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado. And the thing that I connected with most was a king's crown or a queen's crown, which is a beautiful wildflower. And I just sat and photographed it for more than a half an hour because that's what I was connecting to, even though I was surrounded by some of the most amazing mountains in this country. Uh, so I always try to make those connections in the moment and arrive without expectations because I never know what's going to catch my eye. And then I also try to approach nature photography with the idea that there is always something to photograph. Uh, and that if you open your mind to possibilities, you'll see more opportunities. So opportunities exist throughout the day, regardless of light or weather. And I'll talk about how those practices influence the two case studies that I'll talk about. So since we're talking about plants today, I feel like it's important for me to say, like, to answer the question of why plants? Why photograph plants? And for me, I feel like plants really supports that expansive approach that I just described. And in particular, I feel like photographing plants and flowers and trees help me tell a much more complete story of the natural world. So while one big expansive landscape helps tell a story, I don't feel like it always tells a complete story. So by, by thinking more like a naturalist and wanting to know more about an ecosystem and the plants that grow in it and why they exist in certain places and not in other places, uh, like that type of curiosity and knowledge helps me tell a more complete story through my photography. And then unlike the intensity that can sometimes come along with nature photography, photographing plants can be a really contemplative experience. And I think that especially during this particular time, uh, that slow contemplative process is really good for your mental health and your happiness. So just being able to slow down and study the intricate details of a beautiful plant um, is something that's just incredibly enjoyable and that that's something that draws me to photographing plants. And then finally, I feel like plants is, or photographing plants and flowers is one way that I can express my personal interpretation of the natural world. And this plays out in my photography in the ways that you see on the screen. So I have a really busy mind. Uh, I'm constantly thinking about things, uh, sometimes very anxiously thinking about things. Uh, and that, I feel like I'm often all over the place. And through my photography, I'm able to organize the chaos that I see in front of me and that I feel sometimes inside of my mind and find order and find harmony and grace in nature. Um, I also like to seek out simplicity. So that's something that you'll see in the photos that I share today. And then I really enjoy finding beauty in the mundane. Uh, one of the photographs I'll show as a case study is a dormant plant. So just uh, that many people probably walk by and don't think, as, don't think about for a second. Uh, so I really enjoy finding beauty in some of those mundane subjects and then presenting them in maybe a way that somebody, another, an observer or viewer of my photograph might not have expected. Um, I work in both color and black and white. And for my color photography, I tend toward cooler and softer colors. And then when my black and white photography, I focus more on intensity, drama, and boldness. And so I feel like I'm able to find two sides of my personality and, ex and express them in different ways. Uh, so here's a, a selection of some of my color photos and you can feel that, that lighter, brighter feel. And then some of my uh, black and white photos, which generally feel quite a bit more dramatic and have a lot higher contrast and just kind of more intense interpretations. Uh, before I get started with my case studies, I will briefly go through a few lessons that I consider essential to photographing plants and flowers. Um, and the first is particularly relevant to what we are talking about today. So first, plants are everywhere around us. And for those of us that are nature photographers that often travel to the places that we photograph, the last six months have been really hard because we're used to being out in natural places 
Um, and that's a really important part of the identity of many nature photographers. So by not being able to travel as much, it has been a really hard experience. But photographing plants means that there's still opportunities. Um, during the very beginning of our session today, when we were just chatting uh, with participants, uh, one of the things I said was that there are some really interesting weeds growing in my yard. And I think I could potentially take some really interesting photographs of those. So there are subjects everywhere, um, including botanical gardens, so more organized formal presentations of plants, and then also in the wildest places. So the story that I mentioned earlier of photographing uh, the queen's crown plant, that's the photo that you see on the right of your screen. And I photographed that at about 11,000 feet in a high alpine basin uh, that required at least in my case, uh, quite a bit of walking to get to. So uh, plants are everywhere and that's the beauty of photographing plants is you can find opportunities in almost any natural environment, whether it's your yard or the wildest places in nature. And here's an example of me photographing uh, a salsify plant uh, on the side of the road near a lake by our house where uh, this, this salsify plant and my photo of it ended up being the cover of one of my eBooks. So that's one of the beautiful things about plants is they're everywhere and they're, so there's opportunity everywhere. Another important lesson from my perspective is that you can use every single lens in your bag to photograph plants and flowers. I think that there's often a perception that photographing plants and flowers is macro photography so that you're always working really up close to really small subjects. And as you can see through these examples, uh, there are opportunities all the way from 16 millimeters to 400 millimeters plus. Uh, and there are lots of different ways to render uh, plants and flowers in interesting ways using every single lens in your bag. And then finally, I'll just very quickly talk through a few things that guide my approach to photographing plants and flowers. So slowing down and exploring is really important. Uh, I find it really helpful to arrive without expectations because you never know what's going to, to catch your eye. The more that you deepen your observation skills, the more opportunities you'll see in nature. And the second case study that I'll talk about today will, uh, will go into that. That following connections can be really helpful. Uh, and what I mean by that is instead of coming with preconceived ideas, that if you, uh, if you connect with a plant, that that connection is the message that maybe this is something that you should be photographing. So instead of arriving in a garden saying, I'm going to photograph roses today, you arrive and think, I'm going to see what I connect with most, and then I'll focus my energies there. Uh, that there are a broad range of subjects can create beautiful photographs. And my, again, my second case study will go into that. And then uh, being open to all types of light and weather can again help create a lot of opportunities. So the in-depth presentation that Anne and I are going to be giving for Out of Chicago, we'll spend four hours talking about these things instead of 45 seconds. So just another little plug that if you're interested in learning about our approach, uh, that which en encompasses a lot of these things, that the Out of Chicago in-depth session might be something that you could find really helpful. So now I'll move into my case studies. And before I get into uh, the details of the specific case studies, I do want to do a quick introduction of how I think about nature photography and plant photography. Uh, I think about light, my subject selection, and my composition coming together to create a photo. But all of those things are filtered through my vision of how I see nature. So the two examples that I'll, give, I'll show today really go back to some of those ideas about finding beauty in what might be seen as somewhat mundane subjects, really simplifying, uh, focusing on grace and harmony in nature. So those are the ideas that I come to photography with. And then when I'm choosing my subject, looking at light and thinking about composition, those are the things that I filter through my personal vision. So my first case study is a rosette, and I know the name of the plant, but I can't pronounce it. So I'm going to call it a rosette. <laughs> um, I photographed this plant at the San Diego Botanic Gardens last year. And here's the photo that I'm going to be talking about. So you can see that it's rendered in black and white, but I'll show the before and after. And there's not a lot of backstory behind this this photograph other than uh, we were in San Diego to celebrate my husband's birthday. And one of the things that we do when we're traveling in cities, since we live in a town of 900 people, 
our, one of our favorite things about visiting a city is seeing botanic gardens. So we were at the San Diego Botanic Garden wandering around on a really hot, totally clear day. And this is one of the subjects that caught my eye. Uh, you can see here that this is a similar theme in my work. So again, I really like desert plants. I'm drawn to their beautiful shapes and uh, the repetition that you see in, in all of these plants. And I also really like the ability to take a very harsh subject like the cactus in the lower right and render it in a much more graceful and elegant kind of way. So the photo that I'm going to, going to be talking about today fits within this larger body of work. Uh, this isn't the exact plant that I photographed, but it was right next, door, next to it. So you can see this, this surroundings. Uh, so I just thought that it could be helpful to see a slightly larger view of the general surroundings uh, that this plant was growing in. You can see some spider webs and a lot of messiness in the background, uh, some smaller versions of the same plant. Uh, but that, so you just get a sense of what the scene looked like. In coming upon this plant, the thing that I connected with most was the radiating repetition and the natural contrast between the edges of each of the individual leaves and the centers of the leaves. So the, the edges were a slightly different color, which meant that I could add contrast when I, I converted it to black and white. Uh, excluding a lot of context was really important. And I think about this a lot in my photography with regard to composition, that often what you exclude is as important as what you include. So in this case, I wanted to focus just on the central rosette and fill the frame from edge to edge. In terms of details, uh, as you can see in the example of the surroundings for this plant, there was quite a bit of debris. So I wanted to address some of that debris at the moment. And then I knew that I need to clean up some of it a little bit later in processing. And when I clean things up, I mean that I'm doing no damage whatsoever to the plant uh, or the, the natural situation that it's growing in. Like in this case, I moved a stick out of one of the little crevices, but I would never do any damage. Um, and then the final thing that I had in mind when I took the photo is that I could, I could see presenting it in a really dark way with only the center radiating. So I had that idea in mind when I was photographing it. In terms of the technical details, this is a focus stack of 11 files. And what focus stacking helps do is uh, it means that I was able to take 11 files, changing only the focus point, and then uh, merge them later in software, Helicon Focus, so that I could get a one, exp or one file that had every bit of the plant in focus. So in this case, because the center of the rosette all the way to the back leaves was a pretty deep distance, um, you can't tell from the photo, but it's kind of cone shaped. So I wasn't able to get a single, a single exposure wouldn't allow me to get everything in focus. So I had to focus stack to get everything in focus. One of the benefits of digital photography. Um, so this was at 100 millimeters. I was using a 100 millimeter macro lens. Uh, I photographed it at f18 for 0.6 of a second at ISO 400. I didn't use any filters, uh, but I did use a tripod. So with focus stacking for this kind of photo with this longer exposure time, focus or having a tripod is absolutely essential. Uh, because I wanted everything to stay exactly the same except for that focus point. Uh, you can see here that this is essentially how I approach focus stacking for this kind of scene. Uh, I use a mirrorless camera. So with focus peaking, you can see the plane of focus moving across a scene, which helps you decide how many focus points you need. So, so in this case, you could see that I moved diagonally across the scene from one corner to the other and then got the two other corners just for safety purposes. Uh, so I took one exposure at each of those points, changing the focus point, and then merged them together later in Helicon Focus. In terms of the composition, uh, the, the main compositional thing that I was thinking about is how I could fill the frame. And that means that I'm balancing, including as much of the plant as possible while still getting clean edges and corners. So it's really balancing uh, about how much of the plant to include. So with regard to the, the composition, I'm thinking about the orientation of the plant to each of the edges. And I'll show what I mean by that in the next example or in the next slide. 
I'm going to, I was looking for distractions. So there were a couple of leaves on the outer edges that had little imperfections or pretty significant imperfections. So I wanted to exclude those from my composition. I also wanted to center the rosette. So this is one of those rules of landscape photography that you learn where centering a composition is boring and not dynamic. Well, in this case, I feel like centering it gives it its power because the whole idea is that the center radiates outward and that there's repetition from the center outward. So by centering the composition, you emphasize that radiating pattern. Uh, and then I, it's, it's slightly off center, but that's more uh, how the leaves were arranged, but it generally looks when you look at it like it's a perfectly centered composition. Uh, and I also wanted to have clean edges and corners. And then I thought about how each leaf enters and exits the frame. So I don't want any of the leaves to be cut off awkwardly. And I'll discuss how one of them was and what I did uh, to address it. So you can see this bottom leaf here uh, where it's kind, of, it's kind of in, kind of out. So I'd rather have it be either in or out. Uh, so I addressed that in my processing. So with regard to orientation, this is how I'm thinking, how I'm orienting my camera to the subject. And with regard to this thinking through this process, the reason I'm thinking about what orientation is best is how can I include the most plant while keeping the rosette centered and keeping the edges clean? So you can see some examples that I tried by just moving around the subject to see which would be the best orientation. And then I chose the one that I felt had the fewest distractions. A couple of very minor alternatives that I tried. Uh, so here's an example where I removed a small stick that was a distraction because why not remove it when you're there instead of trying to clone it out later. And then I slightly adjusted my framing for the bottom. So you can see that this, this leaf here is tight. Um, I slightly re reoriented my final version so that that leaf was, was uh, going fully out of the frame on that edge. Uh, so it's a very minor thing, but it's something that ca that's an important detail that, that catches my eye. And then I also experimented with shallow depth of field. So in this case, I used F3.5 and focused on the center. And you can see how the details fall as you get towards the edges. Um, and I like this rendition. I just ended up liking the sharper version most. So that's why I processed that version. In terms of my roadmap for this photo, my, I think about processing as, uh, as a creative approach to photography. So I, I am willing to make some changes along the way that help me express my view of a subject better. And that whenever I'm thinking about how I'm going to approach my processing, I want to think about a roadmap. Like before I ever get started, where do I think this photo might go? Sometimes that includes a lot of experimentation before I'm sure. Other times, like this example, I have a pretty clear idea of where I'm headed. So in this case, I knew that I wanted to darken the outside circle, in, increase contrast around the center of the rosette, address that leaf that I've been talking about. So make, make it so that it's a little bit out or that it's um, not right at the edge of the frame. Uh, so this included actually going through the technical process of creating the focus stack in Helicon Focus, uh, converting the file to black and white, addressing the water spots that you see. So at the garden, when they watered the plant, it just a couple of spots that collected a little bit of dirt that I could have easily rubbed off or washed off if it were in my own garden. Um, but I just little details that I wanted to address later. And then I wanted to darken this overall. So you can see here, if you just do the basic black and white conversion in Lightroom, that what you get is the example on the left. If you do customized black and white processing in Photoshop, then you get the example on the right, where you have a, a lot more fine control over the details. And I'm not going to go through the full processing steps, but essentially I, my entire process worked, was focused on working on contrast. So again, darkening the edges and then increasing contrast in the center on the rosette and then cleaning up some of the details. So if you're interested in, in some of these details, I can include a link to this slide in the follow-up so that you can specifically see what that Photoshop panel says if you're interested in some of those details. Uh, but essentially, my goal was to take the, uh, 
the raw file, which had some interesting features and convert it into a much darker, much higher contrast final version. And again, here you can see the final photo. So now I'll go on to my case study, which is a, a desert trumpet plant in Death Valley National Park. And the reason that I chose this photo starts with TripAdvisor reviews about Death Valley. So if you look at the one-star TripAdvisor reviews for Death Valley National Park, they say things like, it's a lifeless brown expanse. Uh, and I, I feel like this is a really important lesson in terms of mindset. So if you approach Death Valley thinking that it's a lifeless brown expanse, that's all that you're going to see. If you approach it with a more open mind, you'll actually see that the park is full of life, including plant life, even in the heat of summer or in the middle of winter. So your mindset has a lot to do with what you're going to see in terms of photography. I also chose this because it's a dormant plant. So it's a desert trumpet that had bloomed. And at this point, by I took this in uh, December or November, the flowers were long gone, but the colors and the patterns were still there. So it was taking a subject that most people would just walk by and say, that's a dead or dormant plant. I have no interest in that. Uh, but even or with an open mind, you can find beauty in subjects that you might not otherwise expect to be able to present as an, as an interesting photograph. So this is a, a continuation of my study of desert plants. So these are all photos uh, that I've taken in Death Valley, including two other dormant plants. So the examples on the right, uh, one is a, an interesting networked or bush that looks like a network of lines and shapes. And then the bottom one is a desert holly that in that case, I think had actually died and probably was never coming back to life. Uh, but another two examples of if you have an open mind, you can find subjects everywhere. So this is the scene that, that you would come upon this desert trumpet plant in. So a canyon that where you can see that plants are growing. And then this is what a desert trumpet looks like when it's dormant. And this photo is something that I got off of Wikipedia because I didn't take my own example photo then. But you can get a sense of, the, of what the whole plant looks like and what the surroundings might look like. So in this case, the guiding ideas were uh, focused a lot on the bright colors in winter. So these really beautiful colors are kind of unexpected in winter. And the repetition. I really liked how all the repeating lines uh, fell across the plant. In approaching the subject, I thought about shallow depth of field because that was essential for simplification. Uh, with a lot of depth of field, this would look like a really complicated subject. With regard to details, I wanted some very careful framing and careful focus. So making sure that again, the subject filled the frame and that I was focused on the right piece of the plant. Uh, the, the opportunity was finding beauty in the mundane, which in this case is a dormant desert wildflower. And then I took this photo in the afternoon on a clear day. So a time that is not typically thought of as being conducive to photography. In this case, it's a single exposure that I took at 100 millimeters, uh, f2.8, so really shallow depth of field, 1 100th of a second. Um, I was hand holding my camera sitting on the ground near this plant. Um, I didn't use any filters and I was facing into the sun. So that kind of glowy light comes from facing into the sun. With regard to the composition, my main goal was filling the frame with the repetition. I wanted to arrange it so that I had even light on the subject and in the background, so no harsh highlights or distracting elements. Uh, this, again, the shallow depth of field helped simplify. I really wanted to focus on the radiating lines. So you see kind of a hub at the bottom and then the radiating lines come out from there and they repeat across the entire frame. Um, I focused on the, this little flower in the middle that's circled by the, uh, the, the blue circle. So that was my focus point. And then I filled the frame with the subject. So it feels like it extends on every edge of the frame. And then I wanted clean edges and corners because little things in the edges and corners can attract unwanted attention. Here are two different views of the same plant or same type of plant taken at different times of day. And the key lesson here is that when you're doing this kind of photography, sometimes it takes a lot of experimentation to see what works. So in the example on the left, there's warm lighting, like the photo that I'm showing is the case study, 
but there's a really uneven background and I don't feel like the pieces of the plant flow very well. It feels really uneven to me. And there are mixed directional cues. So some things are going to the left, some things are going to the right, but they don't really flow well together. In the example on the right, uh, that was much cooler lighting. So a later period in the day. So you get a totally different set of colors just based on the time of day. The focus point is totally off. It's way too far in the background. So you get a lot of distracting elements. Um, and I just feel like it's messy and full of distractions. So again, experimentation with this kind of subject is key because if these are the first two things that I had tried, I'd said, this isn't working and moving on, but I stuck with it, tried, tried a different plant with different lighting and found something that I was really happy with. In terms of this roadmap, so the, the, when I, I have a raw file that I think works, and this is the raw file that you're seeing in front of you, uh, I, I want a roadmap to think this is where I'm at with the raw file and this is where I want to go with my processing. So in this case, I reduced the contrast and then I wanted the warmer color balance for the plants. So I did a little bit of adjustment for warming up those plants, um, making them a little bit more saturated, but keeping the background cooler. So doing some selective color work. I brightened the photograph overall so that it has that light bright feel and then I softened some of the brighter highlights. Uh, the process for doing that, we'll talk more about during our Out of Chicago in-depth session. Uh, but in this case, I'll just say that I softened some of those bright highlights. And then I did do one bit of cloning so that you can see this example in the lower right, or the lower left, I'm sorry. That is a directional cue that's pointing out the left side of the frame. And that sends the wrong message when everything else is pointing upward and to the right. So I did do some cloning. So overall, it's warming up and brightening it. And here is the processing. And again, I can send out uh, screenshots of these with the follow-up so that if you're interested, you can see the, these in more detail. Uh, but I started in Lightroom with reducing the contrast, brightening it a little bit, and increasing the vibrance. And then in Photoshop, I just worked on a few of the little details, like the cloning, saturating some of the oranges, and then adding a soft glow. So it was pretty simple processing, but it took the photo from looking a little bit drab and having some distracting highlights to, in my mind, being a much more pleasing and cohesive photograph. And here is the final version again. And then very briefly, before we turn to Anne, I will just say that um, I'm always happy to hear from you. So if you have any questions about anything I talked about today, you're always welcome to get in touch and you can do that at info at naturephotoguides.com. So with that, my case studies are done and we will turn it over to Anne. Okay, I will share my screen. All right, can everybody see that okay? Yes, looks great. Okay, all right, this is just a little sampling of my work. Um, I, I love putting these little collages together. I don't shoot everything in pink and green, but um, I just really love the way all these images work together. All but one of these um, is shot, are shot with lens baby lenses. Um, the lotus in the upper uh, left is is with a 100 to 400 lens because I that was far away and I couldn't get close to it. So um, just a little bit of, of what my work is is like. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit first about my vision when I'm composing a subject and, and starting my workflow of working with a subject. So first and foremost, just like Sarah, I take a slow and mindful approach. And this is not just in choosing my subject, which, which I do take a lot of time choosing my subjects, but it's in working with my subject. I tend to stay with my subjects for quite some time, sometimes as much as two hours with the same um, flower or plant. And I really work it and explore it. And I think that's really key to um, unleashing creativity. I think that's where the creativity happens when we really keep ourselves open to that experimentation. Um, I look for subjects with interesting details and subjects that evoke emotion and elicit a story. A big body of my work is, you know, again, connected to that idea of using, using um, photography as, as a type of therapy almost. Um, I, I 
it, the first thing I do when I when I sit down with my subject is is to try to make an emotional connection with that subject, so that I can bring myself into the um, into the work. Um, I'm very much process oriented. I enjoy the process of creating an image and enjoying my time in nature immersing myself in that process and really finding joy. I think if there's one thing we've learned in this pandemic that life is precious, it's short, and we should love what we do. And um, this is why the process of creating is so important to me. It's not so much about the final image. Yes, those images are fun to have, but for me, they almost really serve the purpose of reminding me of what my time in the field was like. So that's, that's really where it is for me. Um, I'm, I love to experiment and just like Sarah, be open to possibilities. I don't want to go into the field with a lot of expectations. I want to be open to just seeing what I see on that day. Because if you go, if you go out to shoot and you have high expectations of, oh, I'm going to get that perfect water lily today or that perfect dahlia, you're going to be disappointed. So keep your eyes open to possibilities. Um, I tend to look at my subjects abstractly in terms of lines, curves, patterns, shapes, light, and gesture. Um, this is a, a way of, of seeing my subjects that really grew out of moving from a more literal interpretation of my subject to looking within my subject and um, looking for those abstract qualities. And that a lot of that came from, from um, shooting from everything fully in focus to using selective focus and shallower depth of field. Um, compositional rules are tools for me. They're, I, I keep them in my toolbox and I pull them out when I need them, but I'm not afraid to break the rules. I'm not bound by them. I make my choices in how I compose my image by the story that I want to convey. That is front and center with my work. It's, it's how do I want to bring this story or this emotion forward in my work? Um, simplifying my composition is important to eliminate those distractions. You've heard Sarah already talk about that. We have many similar ideas. I want to draw the eye to what's important. So again, this is something we'll be going into in, in depth in our, um, in our presentation. All right, so where do I begin? This process can be really overwhelming. I think particularly with beginning photographers, how do you decide? Am I going to am I going to use, you know, a, a, um, a higher aperture and capture all the details to bring that story forward? Or am I going to reach for a lens baby and do it with a shallower depth of field and really emphasize a line or a curve? There's no right or wrong answer here, by the way. It's really a lot of it has to do with my mood on that particular day or what I see, what my vision is. So there's, there's, you know, I, I work in a, a range of different ways with my work, depending upon what I want to say about that image. So what I do find helpful when I begin my field work, and I love to share this process with others, um, to kind of overcome that overwhelming feeling is to ask myself a series of questions that then guide my composition. They help me connect to my subject and they spark creative thinking. So if the first thing that I, I ask myself is what's drawing me to my subject? What is it in that flower or that plant that, that's, that's bringing me in? Why did I choose this subject? And how does it make me feel? That's the most important question that I can ask myself. And then how can I compose that to bring that story or emotion to the viewer's eyes? What aperture shall I start with? And again, there's no one right answer or wrong answer. You can start somewhere and oftentimes I, it's, it's just a gut feeling for me, but it doesn't mean that during that shoot, I'm not experimenting with a full range of apertures and trying all sorts of different things. I want to pay close attention to my light. Where's the light coming from? Is there something that I can do to manipulate that light to make this a better image? Or am I just gonna go with that light? What's happening in my background? Backgrounds are incredibly important and they're one of the ways that we can simplify our, com 
our composition by um, eliminating distractions. So I'm, I'm always keyed into my background, even as much so as my subject. And then finally, what lens is going to help me successfully capture my story? And I, I realized that, you know, you might come to the field with one or two lenses that you're going to use. And I would encourage you to use both of them and really experiment. You know, I tend to have this whole backpack full of lens babies and I want to try them all, but I have to start somewhere. So again, it's a lot of it's led by the feeling that I want to depict in the, the image. All right, so I'm going to talk about two very, very different images. The image on the left is a lotus that's very fully in focus and a more literal interpretation of my subject. Um, the image on the right is, is um, that's actually shot with the lens baby soul, one of my absolute favorite lenses. And it's, it's with a shallow depth of field, f3.5. And there's a, there's a deep story there for me. I had a, a, a very strong emotional reaction to that, um, to that little grouping of flowers that I'll explain to you when we get to that image. But these are very different ways of shooting. So, you know, again, there's no one right or wrong answer in terms of how you choose to shoot something, but you should be guided by, your, by um, what your emotions are telling you. So let's start with the Russian red lotus. This was photographed at Chicago Botanic Garden a, a few years ago. These are in bloom right now. I, I was photographing another one of these just uh, a couple of days ago. They're, they're very few and far in between because they only last for about a day. So you kind of have to be there. And that's you know one of the wonderful things about living close to a garden. Um, I want to clarify why that background is black because that doesn't happen very often um, and it's not a backdrop that I've held up. You can't do that in an aquatic garden. In fact, this was set back. It was quite, it was in a distance. I'm using a long zoom to capture this. Um, what happens in, in botanic gardens, in many of them, they add black dye to the water and um, it's just more visually appealing. You don't see the, the pots in the, below the surface of the water, the root system. And it, it helps control the algae growth in the, in the uh, aquatic ponds. And it's a wonderful thing for us photographers because it just creates these beautiful, um, dramatic backgrounds. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the technical aspects of this image and the conditions it's, it's shot in. Um, this is with a 70 to 300 lens, uh, zoomed out to 277 millimeters. So I'm almost, all, you know, all the way extended. This was quite far away. Um, it's 1 400th of a second at f18. So I'm using a very high aperture to get everything from the front of the petals to the back in focus. That was really important to me for this particular flower. Um, ISO 400, I needed a higher... ISO to be able to hand hold because I was not using a tripod here. And uh, this is another thing that Sarah and I will talk about. Um, I do most of my work handheld, but I realize that there are times definitely when I need to be on a tripod. I'm a bit of a rebel about it, but um, I can get away with it. I have a pretty steady hand. Um, but I don't necessarily recommend that for everyone. It, it really, you know, it depends upon what's best for you to get the most successful images. This was shot in overcast conditions, which is really wonderful light for aquatic plants because I cannot hold a diffuser out over these plants. They're too far away. And direct sun, although it can be great for some subjects, doesn't work well for, for this kind of flower. It would just cause way too much contrast, a lot of burned out highlights and deep shadows. So you want really soft, even light. And so I usually wait to photograph these. Um, and it kind of goes back to that idea of not having expectations because there have been plenty of times I've gone to the garden where it's a full Sunday and there'll be a perfect, you know, water lily or lotus in bloom. And it's just not going to work, um, not for the vision that I have. So some of my connections and thoughts about this image. 
So this image does not have a, an emotional story or um, you know, some deep, dark story that is associated with it, as some of my, my images do. I photographed it because of its sheer beauty and the awe of the subject. And awe is an emotion. It's one that, that you know, I hope we all have and, and can rediscover by photographing nature, that, that sense of wonder and awe. And there are times when I see, you know, flowers like this where I just... Oh, you know, I pay attention to that feeling because I know that that that's a subject I want to photograph. Um, I chose to, to photograph it fully in focus to emphasize the detail and the depth. And I've composed it carefully in camera to eliminate cropping later. Now there's some, you know, variation on the way photographers feel about cropping. I try to get it as right in camera as I can. I'm not a big post-processing person. I don't want to be spending a lot of time behind the computer. Um, so I try to do as much in the camera as possible. The other probably even more important reason is that um, when I sell my work, I print a lot of my clients want very large, big 40 by 60 panels. And, you know, I want every pixel, I want the best possible image quality for those images. So I try not to crop. Um, you know, sometimes you have to give yourself some wiggle room and, and sometimes I look at something later and decide that maybe it just needs a slight bit of cropping, but I do try to get it right in camera. I've composed this off center because what really drew me to this, this composition was that beautiful leading line of the lotus leaf. Um, I feel like it helps anchor the lotus. When I'm photographing um, subjects with, with that dark background, um, the, I, I look for something that's going to help anchor it so it doesn't look like it's just floating in space. So that off-center composition really gives you that beautiful line leading off um, from the lotus leaf. My um, considerations for post-processing are to remove distractions. There's a little bug sitting on one of the petals. It's tiny. You know, if, if you want to capture a bee hovering over a lotus or a dragonfly, that's one thing. But a little tiny bug is just a distraction. So you might not even be able to see it in this. Uh, well, no, you did. This is the final image, so you're not going to see it. But you'll see it in the raw image. Um, there was some dirt spots. There was a, a, a little place on the lotus leaf that needed some cloning. So I want to remove those distractions so that your eye is not pulled away from the sheer beauty of this flower. And then I want to brighten and highlight the center of the lotus to draw the eye in. All right, so here you can see the raw image without processing. It's pretty lackluster. And that can happen when you shoot in overcast light. That's why a lot of photographers don't like overcast light. Um, but that's why we have post-processing. We can bring our images back to life just by doing a few simple steps in post-processing to kind of mimic the light that you would have loved to have had. Um, so you can see there's some bubbles in the water, even in that overcast light, the, the, the bubbles, this, the, they, the water is moving in this aquatic garden, so it does create bubbles. So I want to get rid of those. That's, that's distracting to me. Um, you can see the, the lotus leaf has um, just a little flaw in it that I think pulls the eye away. It's not a, a major thing. And there's some dirt sitting in the cups of the flowers that I want to get rid of. Um, I'm, I'm pretty meticulous about cleaning up my subjects. I blow them up so that I can see them because you can't always see little dirt spots uh, with the naked eye. So I've just learned to blow them up and go over it with a fine tooth comb because the minute I don't and then I print that image, it's going to show up. So um, just get rid of them. All right, so first I, I start in Lightroom. I, I love using Lightroom and I just do a few simple steps here. I um, am increasing my contrast just a little bit to give it some pop because it, it was a little lackluster and, and flat. Um, I love using the white slider it, to add some brightness. I tend to use that more than the exposure slider, but I am gonna brighten this more in another, in Photoshop too. So, um, 
I also um, just, just nudged the texture slider. That's a wonderful new addition to Lightroom over the last year or so that, that is wonderful. You don't want to overdo it, but just bring a little bit more texture out. And then I sharpen. Um, I do most of my sharpening in Photoshop. If I'm going to print an image, I will you know, do a very detailed sharpening in, in Photoshop. But otherwise, if it's just for screen viewing, I, I do it during the, um, I'll, I'll sharpen for screen viewing in the export out of Lightroom once the image is finished. Okay, and then I move into Photoshop. And you can see just a few little layers that, that have made a huge difference in this image. So first I create a, a layer to take care of those distractions with the, the dirt spots, the little insect cloning the lotus leaf. And then I create a, a burning layer where I'm going to get rid of those, those um, bubbles in the water. Now there's a, a number of ways that you could do that and it really depends on the image itself. In this case the background was really black and so by using the burn tool set to the uh, to shadows it just perfectly seamlessly um, got rid of those bubbles. But there might be other times where I would choose to use the clone tool to do that. It, it really depends on, on what that background looks like and how, how dark it is. Um, and as with anything in Photoshop, there's usually, you know, a million ways to, to get the same result. And then after I've done that, I move into um, NIC software, NIC software by DxO, um, to a program called ColorFX Pro. I love this software. I've been using it since way back, um, way before DxO and Google owned it. Um, DxO has made a lot of wonderful improvements to it and upgrades so that it doesn't crash and doesn't have bugs. So um, I really love this software. It, for me, makes photo processing fun and really easy. It's very intuitive software. So I'm going to show you what I do. But, but after I finish with the ColorFX Pro program, I come back into Lightroom and I create a levels layer and just further brighten it. You can see in the, in the dialogue there, I've just nudged that levels layer a little bit to the left just to brighten it further. So this is what the, um, the DxO, um, wait, actually, I want to go back for a second. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you see the palette for all the DxO programs. There's about 10 of them. I tend to only use ColorFX Pro occasionally by Vesa um, and very minimal number of filters. This is like five minutes worth of my processing, but I, I find that it just really adds a lot of impact. So I'm going to click on ColorFX Pro to open it up. And then this is the dialog box that opens. On the left, you see all the different filters that you can use. Here, I'm using Darken, Lighten, Center. And um, you can see where I've, I've placed the arrow. There's a, a, a um, Place Center button that you can click on that and move it to wherever you want to place that little little um, spot of light. And this to me really draws the eye in and adds a lot of drama to your image. So I'm just going to um, use that center luminosity slider to brighten it just a little bit. You can also use the border luminosity slider to create a, a darker vignette, but I'm not doing that here because my background is already dark. I don't need to add additional, um, ad additional um, vignette to that. And that's it. Then I'm going to move on. I'm going to add one more filter that's just going to do um, a little bit more tweaking to the image. So I press add filter and then I'm going to move into the detail extractor. Now this is a, a filter that you have to be really careful with because if you overdo it, it's going to look like HDR on steroids. So you can see here I've used it I think to 12%. I my panel is covered a little bit, but um, I'm just using it a tiny bit and I'm using it selectively by using a control point where that arrow is, um, I take that plus control point, move it over to the center of the lotus, expand it just to the size of the green pod, and then pull just a tiny bit of detail out. It just felt a little flat to me just to 
really show some of the interesting texture in that pod. But I don't need it on the petals. I don't need it anywhere else in the image. I just wanted it on the green pod. And then I hit OK, and I'm done. This, the, both of these, these filters took about five minutes at the most. All right, so here again, you can see the raw image on the left and then how much more impactful it is just with those simple steps in processing um, on the right. All right, let's move on to case study number two, which I call snuggled up. I, I name a lot of my images just because, you know, it, it helps tell the story that, that was elicited from the image. This is shot at um, Garfield Park Conservatory during their spring flower show. It was probably the second week in March, so you can probably see where this is going. Um, they, they have this amazing flower show that starts in February and it goes through May. Of course, they had to close it down, but um, when I was photographing this, I knew that within a few days we were going to be issued the shelter in place um, and, you know, the, the conservatory was going to close and this was probably my last visit there. Um, let me talk a little bit about the technical first and then I'll, I'll share the story of this image with you. Um, this is shot with the Lens Baby Soul 45 and I'm using macro filters to get in closer. The, 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 Soul, will, the Soul 45 will only take you about 14 inches from your subject. So if you really like to shoot close like I do, I'm going to add these little 46 millimeter um, macro filters that Lens Baby sells. And I've actually stacked three filters together here to get really close. Um, this is a tilting lens. It's a very gentle tilt, so you can change the sweet spot of your, of your um, image by, by tilting up or down or side to side or diagonally. Here, I'm actually shooting it straight on. I've got it locked into place and I'm just um, center composing here and getting my focus area, that, that sweet spot of focus, right in the center where this interaction of the tulips is happening. Um, <laughs> One, one uh, 25th, 25th hundredth of a second is really high. You can see why I can hand hold when the, with these lenses um, at 3.5. This is a fixed aperture lens. You can't shoot anything but 3.5, which initially I thought was going to be limiting, but it's actually really freeing not to worry. You just go with that you know, that shallow depth of field and the beautiful blur that this lens gives. It, it really, it gives probably, I think, the most beautiful blur of any of the lens baby lenses. Um, I'm at ISO 400. Yeah, my bad. I didn't need to be that high. I could have been at 100 at that high a shutter speed. But, you know, sometimes I get um, so... <laughs> so into the process that I, I don't look at those details. So um, yeah, 400 is fine though. It's, it's not, you know, there's not gonna be any um, difference in image quality. Handheld, indoors in a conservatory with a glass ceiling. So it's really mimics being outdoors. This was a full Sunday, midday. Um, I used a diffuser. I'm balancing a 12 inch diffuser over, over the flowers as I hand hold my camera, which I'm really, um, really have gotten quite good with that. I know it can be a balancing act, but the little diffusers actually work really well for that. So, um, okay, so some of my thoughts about this image. So when I saw this little grouping of tulips, I thought, oh, that looks like a little family all s snuggled together. And at this point, when we knew that the, the, um, the shelter in place orders were just about to be issued, I, I felt a lot of anxiety. I, I was really worried. My family all lives far away from, from Boston to Connecticut to Denmark. And I was really worried about, you know, when am I gonna see my family again? My daughter um, in Boston was six months pregnant and um, this actually became a story of their family because I saw my daughter, my son-in-law, and my granddaughter just nestled together, um, sheltering at home and, and snuggling up. And that, you know, as difficult as that was, there was some beauty in that for, you know, families to have more time together. Um, 
So I wanted to bring that story forward. Um, this, I wasn't going to put this image out into social media. It was very personal to me and just kind of on a whim I did. And I was floored by the reaction to it because I think everyone was feeling that same thing. Um, you know, we all were feeling a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty, and yeah, we're still there. Um, there's still those feelings. Um, I wanted to use a shallow depth of field and selective focus to draw the eye inward to that little interaction. And that's why I chose the soul. I knew it would do that beautifully. I composed carefully in camera to eliminate cropping later. There was a lot going on outside this image, a lot of other flowers that were interfering. And I wanted to just go in really close to eliminate that and just focus on the story of that little interaction. And then as far as my post-processing, it was very, very simple. I just wanted to brighten the image and then draw the eye again to that little interaction happening. So this is the raw image without processing. It's really not a lot different. It just needed a little brightening. There was a few little spots that needed to be uh, cloned out or, or spot healed a little uh, part of the uh, tulip leaf that was, you know, a little distracting. But as with many of my lens baby images, I don't do a lot of processing. They're really beautiful, straight out of camera. It just might need a few tweaks to bring it to life and to bring the story forward. But there's often times when I open these images and I say, oh, what can I do? <laughs> it's really just, you know, the way I love it, you know, as it is, but I can always find a little something to do. Um, so here I went into Lightroom and I again used that white slider just to give that little pop of brightness. I increased the texture just a nudge, um, just, you know, to bring out the texture in those more focused areas. And then I sharpened. And when I sharpen, especially with these softer focus, you know, blurred images, you don't need to sharpen the blur. So I'm going to use that masking slider to just sharpen the areas that I want to, to, to be sharp. And in this case, it was the, the petals um, particularly on the larger, the larger tulip. So very simple, just a couple of steps in Lightroom. And then I'm going to go into Photoshop and I'm going to create, uh, you know, just do that little tiny, few steps in, in cleaning up the image. Didn't take much. I didn't even create a new layer to do that. I just did it in the background layer, which my bad, probably shouldn't do that either. But, um, and then, um, created a level layer just to, again, brighten it a little bit. Um, and then I went back into ColorFX Pro and I didn't really didn't know at the time whether I was even going to use um, that, that dark and light and filter. I just wanted to experiment with it and see if it added a little something, but it, you know, it might not have. So, um, you know, I approach my, my post-processing with that spirit of exploration that some things might work and some things might not. So um, here again, I press on the Color FX Pro program. It opens up the box. I'm just using that uh, dark and light and center, placing the center, the place center button right in the, in the center where that focus is and just slightly brightening it. Again, my, my reason for doing that is to really draw the eye in. I didn't create a vignette. The, the, actually the lens created just a little bit of a vignette that was just exactly what I wanted around the edges. So um, just, very simple couple of minutes and that was it. That's all I needed to do. And you can see there's not a huge difference, but I think it really um, brought the image more to life. And, th and that's the point. That's why I use post-processing is to really replicate the vision that, that I felt in the field. So um, just want to share with you a, 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 few, a little bit more about this idea of using images that um, convey a story or an emotion, um, because this is the love that, this is the work that I dearly, dearly love doing, and it, it really excites me, and um, it's, it's my favorite work. So, you know, it's very personal to me, and, and, you know, what I can say is that the stories that I create with my images come from me. They come from my 
my history, the way I see the world, my emotional road ba- roadmap that goes all the way back to my childhood that's framed the way that I see the world. And really that emotional roadmap comes from every experience you've had in life from every loss, every joy, every trip you've taken, every relationship you've had, um, every book you've read or movie you've seen feeds into the way you see the world. And I love to help people bring that into their photography because what they're bringing is their self. But what you see in these images might be very different. And that's the beauty of art. Um, So I'm going to kind of tell you the titles of these and let you sort of get your own interpretation. I will tell you that the image on the right was was created um, just a few weeks ago when we were able to get to Boston to to welcome this baby. We spent five weeks there. My daughter had a beautiful baby boy and it was really hard to leave. But the day I came home, I went right to the garden. It had just opened uh, to the public again. And this was the first image that I saw. And it reminded me of a baby resting on a mother's chest. And that was kind of the image that I left Boston with of of my daughter and this beautiful baby. Um, The image at the top, the ferns, was created in my yard during during the shelter in place. I discovered I had things in my yard I never knew were there. And I call that um, we're in this together because that's how it felt. Um, The image of the tulip, the sort of joyful tulip, um, was actually an image that I shot over a year ago, but I totally overlooked it. I didn't even remember that I had shot this. And I was looking back, I I highly encourage people to go back through their catalogs. Um, I was was looking at it. back in April, kind of reminiscing, oh, what am I missing at the garden right now? All those tulips are in bloom. And I found this and it just was such a joyful image. And I call it, we shall dance again. The sunflower was just uh, photographed about a week ago at the garden and I call it, um, wake up sleepy head. <laughs> Cause I just thought it looked like a child uh, trying to wake up, not ready to face the, the world. And then the last image on the, the right is another one that I shot a year ago, but completely overlooked. And it really resonated with me back in April. I call it give it give yourself a hug because I think that you know what we've what we've all experienced has not been easy and we need to practice self-care and take care of ourselves. So these are ways that images can have very personal meanings. You can bring yourself into them and um it creates stories, and, and that's what I really love to do. And I'd love to help other people see this too. Um, so that's me. Um, this is my contact information, um, my website and my um, email address. I do very small, intimate workshops at Chicago Botanic. Unfortunately, they got um, canceled this year, but I hope next year I'll be on target again. I always have Lens Baby discounts, so don't buy Lens Baby products without Um, contacting me. And I welcome really any questions about anything. It doesn't have to be lens baby. Um, But I I love talking anything about plant and and flower photography. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, This is my ebook that is available on visualwilderness.com. It it describes the lens baby lenses that I use for flower photography. It has a lot of tips and a lot of my philosophy about photographing flowers. Um, And we we have discounted it starting today through Sunday. It'll be 20% off. You don't need a discount code. Just go to the Visual Wilderness site. You can do a search. I think Sarah's going to send out a link to it. It's also linked on my website. If you have any trouble finding it, just reach out to me and I'll connect you with it. And then finally, um, just once again, Sarah and my... um, contact information. We'd love to hear from you. And we hope that you'll join us for the uh, Out of Chicago in-depth conference. It's going to be wonderful. And be sure and use that discount code Botanical to get the $50 off. Um, It's it's just going to be jam-packed with information. But um, thank you, everyone. And I will stop sharing my screen. That was great, Anne. 
Thank Lots you. Lots of wonderful uh, comments about your photos and your approach and how oh, thoughtful you are. So wonderful. Oh, wait. Hold on. You got to get this. I think you're good. Oh, I, oh, I, I did. I did stop. Yeah. Oh, I think okay. <laughs> so it's, it's okay? Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, um, Ron and I together have answered 39 of the questions. Whoa. Um, <laughs> so if you had a question that you asked, we answered a lot of the questions in writing because we just will not have time to get through them all. But I saved a couple that I thought we might want to discuss together. Okay. So I will start with a question from Kathy. And she essentially asks if we find that it's necessary or not to have botanical knowledge of plants and flowers and how that kind of knowledge can either help or not help in, uh, through our photography. Oh, that's a wonderful question. I love that. I've never gotten that question. Um, well, I can answer it from my own personal um, experience. Yes, I think, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's not necessary to go into this type of photography knowing it, but I think you can learn as you go. That's, that's what I've done. Um, one of the things I love about photographing at a botanic garden is that there are horticulturists everywhere. And I, I use them as resources. They love to talk plant talk. <laughs> and so I often ask them questions about why does why does this plant do this or why does it bloom this way or you know what's going on with it and then I often find that that I just start googling things and I want to learn more it's just it's just my own personal curiosity but I think you can it's something you can learn as you go it's not you know I mean I've always said if I had another day in the week I would love to to take a botany class um, I, I would just I I think it's just so fascinating, but um, unfortunately I don't have another day in the week, <laughs> but I just, you know, I do the best that I can. Um, and what do you think, Sarah? What, is that your approach too? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that you don't need the knowledge to get started at all. No. But I think that once I started reading about plants and learning about uh just more of their background and their associates and like it started leading me into greater curiosity and that more the additional curiosity made me want to visit different types of botanical gardens in different geographic regions because they'd have different kinds of plants uh, seeing different kinds of variety so for me it was more about like the knowledge has increased my curiosity which i think has propelled me to go to different places and see things in different ways so um, like learning more about cactus and desert plants made me want to get to the desert botanical gardens in Phoenix. Uh, seeing Anne's lotus flowers made me want to do research and learn more about them and see where I might be able to go and see them. So I think it like what Anne and I have a very similar approach. Like it's that it feeds the curiosity and that causes you to take the next step, which then expands your opportunities. Right. And makes you appreciate what you're photographing all the more. The more okay. you know about it, the more you're going to, you know, fall in love with those plants and, and appreciate them. So there's, there's so many different resources out there. Um, but if you do visit a botanic garden, most of, you know, again, my experience with horticultures is they love being asked questions. <laughs> so don't be afraid to ask. And since I do a lot of my work in nature, um, getting gui local guides, right. they'll, they'll tell you more about the plant, the local plants. And then you could like the idea of, oh, I want to see this plant. I'm going to go look for it. Like I was absolutely obsessed with a turtleback, which is a, a dome shaped plant in Death Valley National Park. So we went on a couple of different hikes because I wanted to see if I could find one. Um, so it just really got me out and exploring the landscape in a new way, just because I had seen that plant and I wanted to see it in person. So um, uh, any uh, like wildflower guides, uh, botanical guides, it just, it, that knowledge just helps propel the interest, I think. Okay. Yeah, totally agree. Great question. <laughs> Um, this one I left because I've, it's, I don't, this isn't about the business of photography, but I felt like I wanted to answer this question. So Linda says, I have always loved selective focus. Um, in watching another person's webinars, he mentioned that the only people who like selective focus are other macro photographers. 
and that he has never sold a selective focus image. Can you? I know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> no, we don't need to name names. I left out the, <laughs> the name. <laughs> I, I can start with this one because I was just fired up about it. First of all, it, I don't care if other people like my photos or not. And um, I don't really care if they're commercially viable because it's a form of personal expression for me. But I have sold so many selective focus photos. People like them in their homes. Um, one of the major phone manufacturers in this country, not they don't manufacture them here, here but they sell them. Um, I've had a couple of selective focus photos as their backgrounds. Um, so I'd say I have sold a lot of selective focus photos. Anne, do you have anything to say about that? Well, that, that's so wonderful to hear because, um, you know, and I feel exactly the same way that you, you, you know, I, it's nice. It's nice when people want to buy my work, but I create my work for me. And um, I'm not going to shoot to sell my work. I'm going to shoot the way that brings me joy. Um, as I said, life is just too short. And, and if I sell photos, that's great. Um, I found that most of my work, and, and this may be slightly biased by an exhibition that I had, are the more sharply focused. And that's probably because um, I had a big exhibition at Chicago Botanic as a part of their orchid show. And uh, a lot of the images were very sharply fo focused. There, there was a, you know, a variety, but the ones that sold were not necessarily the ones that captured my heart or that I had particularly loved photographing, but people like to know what they're, you know, what they're seeing. But I was really excited because um, earlier this year I was approached by a hospital to create a, a or to you know they wanted to buy some of my images to to um, put in a, a woman's hospital and almost everything that they picked was softer focus in fact they were mostly lens baby images so that was really exciting to me you know to I, I think people are becoming more appreciative but there's always going to be people that don't understand it and that's okay I don't you know but if we're both starting from the point of wanting photography to be about personal expression, like I love the softness and the feeling of elegance and grace that comes from just that single plane of focus with everything else falling out and the abstract feeling. Uh, so the, the whole idea of like, that's what gets me excited. And I love that look that I'm going to photograph it. Yeah, exactly. So. Great. Thanks, yeah. Anne, for your view on that. Um, so we said we were going to end by 530. So I will ask maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Um, I liked this question from Kimberly. I too try to embrace an expansive approach to photography, but I'm often stymied by our long winters in Maine. The days are very short and it feels like the botanical opportunities are more limited, especially since we don't have any conservatories. Any thoughts? What do you think, Anne? Oh, I, I think I know. Hi, Kim. <laughs> um, well, it's it's hard. It's really hard. Um, you know, I tend to kind of go into those creative sluts in the winter because there's just not as much to photograph. And I'm not really a cold weather person. Yeah, I am lucky because we have two amazing conservatories that I can photograph in. But I think that if I didn't have that, I would probably bring, be bringing flowers into my own home and, and doing that, you know, setting up a little studio. It's not my favorite way to shoot, but, but it would still, you know, keep me active, keep me creative. You know, there's, there's, um, um, you, I mean, there's, there are things that you can do if you, if you even have plant nurseries that, that have greenhouses, just approach them and ask them if you can, um, shoot in there. I mean, I have a florist literally two blocks away that says, come in anytime, you know, and just, just spend the day here. They're very generous about it. And I always offer to give them some images. We also have an orchid supplier not too far from here that welcomes people coming in. So be resourceful, do a little, um, you know, it might be a little harder in Maine, I have to admit, but um, yeah, I would bring flowers into your home, you know, if, but, but, 
get out and look in the landscape because even in the winter there are things to photograph if, if you don't mind the cold. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I go to Chicago Botanic Garden year round and, and look for interesting things. It's just that I might not be able to stay outside for extended periods. It gets really cold in Chicago. Um, but there are things to photograph in every season. I think all of Anne's responses are fantastic. Uh, like we've found that uh, people who own greenhouses are like one of my favorite places to photograph was a greenhouse in uh, Tucson in the winter. So they were excited to allow us in as photographers. So if you do have facilities like that, like Anne mentioned, building some kind of reciprocal relationship right. uh, with a florist or uh, a greenhouse, somebody that's growing plants in the winter, uh, I also find that there's a lot of beauty in plants in the winter, even when they're dormant and that you might not be seeing really vibrant flowers and other features. But if you're focused on things like patterns and repetition and just lines and shapes uh, instead of the actual subject itself, uh, winter can bring a lot of opportunities with plant photography too. Yeah. Um, and then uh, like in my case, in my house, we have one window that gets a lot of sun and I have a kind of ridiculous number of succulents growing there uh, because I can photograph them at all times. Uh, so, and they only require watering every two weeks in the winter. <laughs> so they're super easy to grow as long as you have some sunlight. So ordering flowers, growing some of your own greenhouses, florists, ordering flowers, like all those things can, I, I think that's what, what I have done during this corn or the stay at home orders. I've right. ordered some flowers. I photographed my own yard. I photographed plants in, in my living room. Um, so you could repeat all of those during the winter. Yeah. And there's some, there's actually uh, one plant that comes to mind um, that I actually prefer photographing in winter is, is the hydrangea. Um, I just think they, I, I never cut mine back in the fall. I keep them, um, you know, keep the dried brown flowers so that I can photograph them. And they're beautiful covered in snow, but I think they're much more interesting, um, you know, in the winter than they are in the, in the summer when they're in full bloom. So, you know, trees, trees that have snow covering the leaves can be beautiful. That's a great point about how things can sometimes look even better in the fall and winter, like sedums and succulents. Uh, sometimes take on much more vibrant colors under mm -hmm. cold conditions. So that's something that if your hort horticultural zone or you, your USDA zone will support, um, you can grow really car cold hardy succulents in your yard that will survive during the winter and they get really colorful. One of my favorite photos of my own of some sedums were taken in the middle of winter and they were this vibrant pink and green colors even though it was December. So yeah. that was, that's a great point, Anne. Um, if you could recommend what lens, one lens, what would it be? Oh, for me? <laughs> like if somebody was just getting started and didn't quite know where to start, but well, they really like your, your approach, what do you think you would recommend? Well, it would be hard for me not to recommend a lens baby, but you know, I think that if you're just getting started in this, this kind of photography, it, it's really good to have a just a you know a good solid macro lens like I started my photography with a hundred millimeter macro and and then you know branched out from there some people prefer a longer focal length like a 180 macro because they can get a little bit more distance they can blur their backgrounds a little um, but if you are interested in jumping right into lens baby um, these, these lenses can be used for, for macro photography. Um, of course, I think probably my absolute favorite would be the Velvet, the Velvet 56 and the Velvet 85, um, with the sole coming a close second. But the Velvets are just uh, amazing lenses. You can get very close to your subjects with them. They do have a learning curve. They, um, they're manual focus, manual aperture. Um, but, you know, I have a book all about that that teaches you all the tips and tricks, and it just takes a lot of practice. So, you know, if that's, if, if you already have a macro lens, then I would say, you know, think about expanding to a, a, a creative artistic lens like that. But, you know, it's kind of a, a personal decision as to which, which way you want to go. <laughs> 
Yeah, and mine would be kind of the opposite tool. I would choose a 100 to 400 telephoto probably uh, because I think of that as my secondary and very heavy macro lens, but it's so versatile. You can still get a nice blurry background in some cases. Um, so uh, that's probably where I would start. And since a lot of nature photographers already have that kind of equipment, if you're moving into plant photography, it's a good tool to start with without having to add something to your bag. Right. And there are ways to even work around, um, you know, if you have, say, a 24-105 lens, something like that, you can get a close-up filter like the, the Canon 500D, um, or you can use extension tubes, and those will get you in closer. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to buy a new lens. There are ways to work around that with just some very inexpensive um, extension tubes. I think mine were about a hundred dollars. Um, and I use them a lot. I use them with my lens babies. I use them with, with all my lenses, um, as a way to get in just a little bit closer. And I think the last question, um, that we'll respond to is around, uh, the acrobatics that are sometimes required of photographing <laughs> plants and flowers. Um, so, <laughs> Michelle says, Anne, you stated that you balance a small diffuser. <laughs> Can you explain how you handhold your camera and a diffuser? Because I'm interested in hearing this too. <laughs> well, it takes getting into these kind of weird <laughs> yoga poses. My, I have a, a cute story because, you know, my daughters always, they keep saying to me over and over, mom, mom, you should take yoga. It would just be perfect for you. And I said, I already do yoga. <laughs> It's just in the field. Um, I find myself in really strange positions. And that's partly because I'm hand holding and I can, you know, I can get in closer. I can, um, you know, I, that's why I love hand holding because I, I want to be able to really, you know, get into those strange positions that you might not be able to get into with a tripod. Um, and again, I'm not trying to say that you should, you know, shoot without a tripod because, yes, I will tell you, I do probably better, more precise work with a tripod, but I just love that freedom. But yeah, it just takes some practice. Um, yeah, and just, you know, learning to kind of really hold your body very still. And, um, you know, I think that's, you know, good at developing your core. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. I, you know, I think it, you know, keeps me fit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is one benefit of using the tripod because then you can use your hand to move the, because I'm not as steady as Anne. Like I wish that I had the steadiness that she has. Um, like I've tried all the breathing stuff and sometimes I'm okay if it's bright enough outside, I'm okay. But I almost always have to work on a tripod just because of the way my body works. Um, so that's one benefit. If then I can hand hold my diffuser. Um, but it's such an important tool, like creating your own shade creates all sorts of opportunities. And what we've both been talking about today is all about creating opportunities and seeing things in new, new ways. So with that, I think we'll end this session. Um, if we have piqued your interest and you want to learn more from the two of us, we really hope that you will participate in our out of Chicago in-depth session. Again, that's August 21st through 23rd. Um, and we both are happy to hear from you. So if you have more questions that we weren't able to answer, you're welcome to reach out. Um, and then I will send out a recording or a link to the recording tomorrow, probably in the morning, depending on my, how my slow rural internet does with downloading the video. Um, and then we will send out uh, some additional notes. So uh, about my eBooks and Anne's eBook, so that if you're interested in those resources, you know how to get them. And then we'll also send out more information about the Out of Chicago in-depth. So we really appreciate everybody participating today. We had such a fantastic turnout. So it was really exciting to be able to share our approach to flower and plant photography with everybody today. Um, Anne, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Just thank you. It was a delight. And, and thank you, Sarah, for just kind of getting this all organized. It was really fun to do. It's been such a pleasure working with you. Yeah, you as well, Anne. We're a and good team. <laughs> we are a good team. It's fun that we have such, a, such similar approaches, but then we apply them in different ways. Right, so. right. right. Well, thanks, everybody. We really appreciate you participating. And look in your um, e email inbox probably tomorrow morning for all of the follow-ups. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.